Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter, and welcome to the Daily Check-In for October 23rd, 2020. It is Friday, which means it's HashiCorp Vault Friday. We're going to be talking about vault certification. Specifically, we are still hanging out on Objective 9, which is all about the vault architecture, the internal guts that makes vault go. So far, we've covered storage and we've covered just the overall architecture when it comes to the barrier and how data enters and, and leaves the vault server. Now we get to talk about multiple vault servers and clusters and replication and all of that crazy stuff. So that is what we're going to dive into today. Before we get into that, I just want to mention that my vault certification guide is still rolling. I'm still on objective six for writing. Objective six is the CLI and it is a lot of writing because there's a lot of CLI. So I'm slowly making my way through that. It is available on LeanPub and there will be a link in the description if you're interested. It's only $15 and you get the updates as I add them. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, I think that's the only, oh, did you know I have a whole separate podcast called Day 2 Cloud? I do. And if you are interested in cloud technologies, then this is the podcast for you. That is what me and my co-host Ethan Banks talk about with different guests on every episode. It comes out weekly. You can find that at day2cloud.io. That's D-A-Y-T-W-O dot cloud.io. And I'll include a link down in the description for that as well, if you're interested. Let's check in. How are you? It's Friday. You made it. You did it. You did the thing that got you all the way through this crazy week. And now you get to reap the sweet, sweet rewards of the weekend. So I hope you have something amazing planned. I hope you're doing okay. I'm going to go get some pumpkins because we got to carve some jack-o'-lanterns and that's going to be my big thing this weekend. Now this is probably going to run a little long, so I'm going to dive right into Vault and how the clustering and HA work. So really, when you talk about vault clustering, you're talking about high availability for the most part. Unless you purchase vault enterprise, really what you're getting is an active passive configuration where there's one active vault server and then one or more standby servers. They're hanging out, they're waiting for that active server to fail and to take over for that. And basically when one fails, they hold a little election and they decide through some process who should be the new vault active server and take over requests. That is what it's all about. That is how it works. Now, there is a lot more to it than that. So I do want to dive into that. And let's start with the storage. We talked about the storage last week and you need some storage that supports HA if you want to do this active passive. And what happens on that HA storage, it needs to be accessible by all of the vault servers. And one of them puts a lock. They're the active server. They have put a lock in that storage backend that says, I'm the current active server, no one else. And then if that active server fails, then the standby servers can hold an election and somebody else puts a lock on that storage. So that storage needs to support it. Now, what's interesting is your data, your vault data doesn't actually need to live on the same storage backend as your HA. You can have an HA backend and an HA storage backend and a data storage backend. Why would you do that? Well, you might want to use something cheap and simple for your data storage, something like, I don't know, S3 or object store on Azure but you might already have something that's a little more complicated or sophisticated that you just want to use for HA. Like you've already have a console cluster going. You can use that just for HA, but store your data somewhere else. So that is supported. Once you have that in place, you now have to correctly configure your servers to communicate with each other and also communicate with your clients. The cluster communication happens on port 8201. That is how the servers talk to each other and they need to know what address they should be talking on. So in the configuration of your vault server, you actually tell it, here's the cluster address that you should be talking on and it's cluster underscore ADDR. That value tells the other servers in the cluster, here's the address I want you to talk to me on. And they also do some communication across that HA storage backend to coordinate some of this. So if they don't have direct network communication with each other, they can still inform each other using that HA storage backend. So it's another sort of transport medium for them. Now, what happens when a client request comes in? Good question. One of two things can happen. The first is that the request could be forwarded. Let's assume 
that the request comes in and it goes to one of the standby servers. Let's say you're using DNS round robin. So all of your vault servers have their own individual DNS name. You've got server A, B, C, but you have vault.myservers.example.com as an address that points to the IP address of all three of them. And it's just whichever one you get connected to when you do a DNS query, that's what you get. So you might get a standby server. In fact, it's more likely you will. What does that standby server do with your request? Well, in the first case of request forwarding, all it does is it takes a look at the cluster, the current active server, looks up its cluster address and creates a tunnel to that server and forwards your request along. That's it. It's really simple. It gets a response back from the active server and then passes that response back down to you. Bob's your uncle. Very simple. You don't need a load balancer in front of your vault servers. All you need is that DNS round robin record to cycle through basically. So that's a very simple way of doing it. And it works for the most part. You don't need a load balancer. The other method, and I should say the request forwarding is the default method that vault server will try to use. Now it does have a fallback method or you can explicitly enable this method and this is a client redirect. So when I send my request, if I get one of the standby servers, it's gonna say, I'm standby, let me look up the address to talk to the other, the active server. Okay, I have that. And this time it doesn't look up the cluster address, the cluster underscore ADDR setting that you put in for that active server. It looks up a different setting, which is the API underscore address value in that active server's configuration and sends that back as a redirect message to the client saying, here's the address that you should be going to, to talk to the active server. And then the client respects the redirect and goes and talks to the active server. So it's a, it's a couple more hops. And if you have it behind a load balancer, it, you can run into some challenges. What do I mean by that? Let's envision that I've got server A and server B. Server A is the active, server B is the passive. Now, Let's say they're both behind a load balancer. That load balancer has that API address, vault.example.com. And then these individual servers have their own API addresses, vaultae.example.com and vaultb.example.com. But those are actually both gonna be associated with the load balancer because you can't talk to those servers directly. You're talking through the load balancer. So when my client request comes in, it's gonna go to one of the two servers. If it goes to the standby server, the standby server is going to go, oh, you want to talk to vault.example.com and it sends a redirect. And so my client tries to go to vault.example.com and the load balancer is going to go, oh, this is an active session I have. I'm going to send it back to the standby server and you have a loop. What you need on that load balancer is the capability to look at the health status of each of the vault servers in your configuration. And if you go to the health status page, if it's the active server, it gives a 200 response. And if it's the standby server, it gives a 400 response. So as long as your load balancer can look at that and do a health query and go, oh, okay, the only active server I should be sending traffic to is the one that responds with 200, you're good to go. You're fine. The alternative is to have the load balancer use that vault.example.com for initial communication and your individual servers also have a public IP address or an internal IP address you can get to with their own DNS name of like server a.example.com. So it can get complicated pretty quickly. This is something you probably want to read about and study up on because I guarantee there's going to be some sort of clustering question and I get confused trying to explain it to other people. So trust me, read up on this one. It's going to be immensely helpful. Okay, so that's client requests. It can either be a forward to the active server through the standby or it can be a client redirect from the standby server to the active server. But you have to be careful about load balancers. Like I said, there's basically two models here. You can either have direct access to the servers with no load balancer sitting in the front, or you can have a load balancer sitting in front, but you just gotta make sure that it can do proper health monitoring of your cluster below it. Okay, so that covers cluster addresses. So that definitely read up on the docs on that. It can get very confusing very quickly. Now, I did say there, so these standby servers, in case you haven't noticed, don't service any requests on their own. They simply either redirect or forward the request to the active server. Now, 
generally speaking, according to HashiCorp, the bottleneck on Vault is going to be your storage backend. It's not going to be the individual servers. But you may run into high volume transactional kind of environments where you do need to scale out your Vault cluster to handle requests. And they have an enterprise only option that is called performance standby nodes. So these are your standby servers. And if you have this feature enabled, they will service requests, but only read requests. So they won't create new information. If you send a write request to that server, it's going to redirect or forward it to the active vault server, but all read requests can be serviced by the standby. And you can see how that can greatly reduce the load on the active server. So that option, 100% available, you can do it, but you need the enterprise license, which is not free. So just bear that in mind. If you're using open source only, you're not, you're not gonna have this feature. That's what it comes down to. Okay, so that takes care of the describe cluster strategy objective. The other objective I wanted to cover today is be aware of replication. And this is the sort of thing you don't need to know the guts. And part of that is because it is an enterprise only feature, but you do need to be aware of what it can do. So, so far we're talking about a cluster that's in probably one data center or one region in the cloud. But what if you want resiliency across regions or across data centers? That's where replication comes in. And basically there's two flavors of replication. Now the unit of replication is the cluster. So you have a primary cluster and then one or more secondary clusters. Hmm, that's kind of like the active standby model, right? So the parallels don't stop there. Your primary cluster replicates to secondary clusters in an asynchronous manner. So it's not synchronous replication. It doesn't wait for the acknowledgement on the other end. It just synchronizes it when there's time. You have two options, like I said. One is a performance replication option. What does that mean? It means that your secondary clusters, just like the standby performance node, can service requests as long as they're read only. If they are not read only, if they're right, then it will forward that request to the primary cluster, which is gonna end up on the active server. So just kind of like bear that in mind. It also means that those performance cluster, those performance standby clusters are going to have to manage their own token store and leases because they are serving active requests. So that's the performance standby. The other one is the disaster recovery model. Still does the replication, but in this case, it doesn't service any requests. It can just be failed over to in case the primary cluster goes down, that one of the DR clusters, one of the secondaries now becomes the primary in the same way that a standby becomes an active in the cluster. It does not maintain its own tokens and all that jazz. It simply is mirrored that information from the primary. So in theory, you could kind of have a pretty seamless failover if something goes wrong in your main region. So that's the replication. You don't need to know how to configure it. Just understand kind of what it does. And I think that's going to do it for today. We've covered two more objectives, which is awesome. I think we're really down to explain response wrapping and the value of short-lived dynamically generated secrets, which, <laughs> and uh, the vault agent and secrets caching. So those are the remaining sub objectives for objective nine. I think I'm going to end up doing two more videos for this objective. It is so big. And then we have objective 10 and then we're done. So that's kind of exciting. All right, so that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed all this, hey, if you don't mind subscribing, I really appreciate it. And if you could share with some other people who are interested in vault, I'd appreciate that too. That's all I have for today. Again, thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe out there. Bye for now.